Network for U.S. Cuba Foreign Trade and Investment. Uh, we have a uh, stellar uh, cast of presenters uh, for you uh, this morning. And uh, let me just quickly introduce everyone and then um, I'll give them their turn. Uh, we have four speakers and uh, two discussants. And uh, hopefully we'll have a little bit of time at the end for questions uh, from those here present. Um, so um, our first speaker is uh, Professor Jose Aguilondo. Um, Professor Aguilondo is um, at FIU, Florida National University. He's an expert on uh, tax and finance law. Graduate of Harvard uh, College and Berkeley Law School. He's a prolific uh, scholar on uh, financial regulation, banking, social issues in Cuba, wide range of um, interests. And he's a frequent uh, news commentator on Sp Spanish language media. You may have seen him on Univision or the Mundo on the stations. Um, second speaker uh, that we have is uh, Matias Travieso Diaz, who's um, was a partner at Pillsbury Winthrop Shaw and Pittman until March of 2015, just recently retired. He has degrees in engineering from the University of Miami and PhD in engineering from Ohio State, graduate of Columbia Law School. Um, his, folk, his, his, his work has been in commercial transactions and uh, litigation and arbitration on nuclear and fossil fuel projects. And he's uh, published books on legal reform in Cuba. Our third panelist is uh, Rolando Anillo. He's a graduate of uh, Havana Law School, is, uh, admitted to the bar in both the United States and Cuba. He uh, specializes in US and Cuba uh, federal uh, regulations, the application of them. Uh, he's uh, president of the Cuban Claims Owners Association, which is an organization uh, dedicated to uh, find ways to settle the outsta uh, outstanding claims for uh, expropriated properties in Cuba. Um, our fourth uh, panelist is uh, Pedro Freire, who is the chair of Ackerman Law Firm's uh, international practice. His uh, practice focus is foreign investment, both um, inbound and outbound. He specializes in the areas of construction um, and financing. Uh, he's an expert on, uh, noted expert on the U.S. embargo on Cuba and advises companies on legal uh, transactions on ways to structure transactions legally. He's a lecturer at uh, Columbia University Law School and uh, an adjunct professor at Florida International University College of Law. Those are four distinguished panelists. We have uh, two commentators as well. Um, this morning, um, Jose Manuel Pai, who's a Cuban born and Argentinian raised. Uh, he's a lawyer uh, in Argentina, with law degrees in Argentina, founder of the um, worldwide title company, um, which is um, sort of a title search and, um, and sort of title um, recording um, focused uh, company worldwide. He's co founder of the US Cuba Legal Forum. He's worked with the National Law Center for Inter-American Free Trade in Arizona and the Instituto Libertad y Democracia in uh, Peru, which is the brainchild of uh, noted economist Hernando de Soto. Um, he's a member of the Comité Latinoamericano de la Consulta Registral. We're very glad to have him with us as well, as well as all the others. And uh, last but not least, we have Tony Zamora, who just walked out, I believe. Uh, as one of the commentators, he's practiced law in Miami for over 40 years um, in the areas of international law, foreign investment in Latin America. He's uh, the founder of the Cuban American Bar Association, uh, president of the Q U.S. Cuba Legal Forum, graduate of UF and UM, who's JD from UF. He's published numerous articles, and um, he's also an adjunct professor at Florida International University. Uh, so, without taking any more time, I hand it over to uh, Professor Gabilondo. Uh, thank you, Jorge. Jorge is my colleague at the, at the FIU College of Law, and who is head of our international department. He's a very distinguished international career of his own, which he didn't talk about. I want to thank Jorge and Carlos for putting together a great conference, as always, and for organizing this panel, which is very relevant. My title is Establishing Ground Rules for political risk claims about Cuba or for settling political risk claims about Cuba. Now that normalization is underway, 
I have a goal in this presentation, in this project, in this paper, and that is to reduce the moral and legal priority of uh, property claims, unresolved property claims. Now, the context for this project, as we know, D17, this Diciembre 17, uh, was a day when Cuba and the U.S. announced a path to normalization. It's very significant. It hasn't quite unleashed the invisible hand in terms of economic activity in Cuba, but it's on the way. Maybe the invisible pinky has been released. Now, there's a problem because there's this overhang from unresolved political risk, from unresolved property claims, and that creates uncertainty, legal uncertainty about participating in the Cuban economy. Now, it also has discursive impact. By discursive impact, I mean what's the impact in an argument when someone announces my property was stolen? That's a showstopper in the sense that human rights claims are also a showstopper that require participants to lock in certain polarizing positions and limit the kind of exchange that's possible. My argumentative goal here is going to be to decenter property claims. I think that's a good idea because I think it will facilitate normalization and it may even increase the odds of claimants eventually getting something. Now, what's my strategy? I'm going to do three things in this presentation. First, I'm going to emphasize that property is a relative, not an absolute right, at least within the Anglo-American legal tradition. Second, I want to try to situate property claims in the more general context of political risk. And finally, I want to subordinate, not disappear or deny, but subordinate property claims into a wider set of moral and political interests that are at play in the Cuban economy. Now, let me start with the question that's at the background of this is with what's the nature of property? Uh, is property an absolute right that lets you, that gives you kind of a lo que me da la gana basis? That you, that you can do with property, or is instead property uh, a, more of a relative situation-specific bundle of rights and obligations? That's kind of a leading question. And I think the answer, if you look in the Anglo-American legal tradition, is property is a contingent relational right. It is not an absolute categorical right. Let me give you some examples of that. Most of these examples are from Anglo-American common law, although I have some uh, comparative examples from civil law traditions. As anyone who owns property in Coral Gables and has tried to install new blinds knows, property is a relative right because you bump up against zoning. And zoning is an example of a restraint on the use and alienation of property. That's one of the very common kinds of uh, public law restraints. Oh, by the way, I'm addressing only public law qualifications on property because a property owner can, by contract, voluntarily bind himself. But that's an incident of property. That's not a qualification of property. Law uh, in the name of family relations limits your ability to alienate property, dower, courtesy, statutory forced share in this country, la legitima in, um, in, in uh, Spanish-speaking jurisdictions. And there are also bans in this country on racially restrictive covenants. Uh, there are a whole series of legal doctrines that change property rights based only on the passage of time simply the passage of time alone. And that's relevant when you're talking about an embargo that's lasted half a century. Statutes of limitation, latches, which is an equitable version of that, uh, the rule against perpetuities, adverse possession by a squatter, and then there are other involuntary ways that a property owner can lose his property interest. Federal forfeiture laws, uh, takings in eminent domain. Now, these features that I talk about aren't some kind of flaky thing that exists only in Massachusetts and Austin, Texas. They are a, a structural part of what property is because they, it is expressed in constitutional qualifications, common law statutes, and local law. So that's what I think property is. You have to start by thinking, oh, property is a relational uh, contingent right. Now, what do I mean by political risk? Well, political risk is the risk of economic loss arising not from market factors like competition or supply and demand, from, but from the exercise of power by the state. There are a lot of common examples. When you think of political risk, what you're most likely to think of are things like expropriation, capital and currency controls, sanctions and embargoes. These are all political risk. But really, political risk is a much wider set of, uh, includes a much wider set of things like tax policies, 
Or, if you're in the Florida retirement system as I am, public pension reform in Tallahassee is a form of political risk in that the legislature can, through a non-market mechanism, affect your, your rights to retirement. Licensure requirements, regulation generally, a lot of the hostility to the Dodd-Frank Act is in a sense a reaction, a, a business reaction to, to political risk. The inability to manage a public debt limit. I would say that's an example of a political risk that we deal with in this country, particularly with this Congress. And I just want to point out that you could also think there's also upside political risk in the sense that uh, businesses can lobby and seek rents with, from the state. And that's, all, that's a form of political risk, too, just on the upside. Okay. Now, uh, why, what is my goal here? Well, that, my first goal was to tell you that property is relational. The second strategy I want to I want to follow is I want to situate these property claims as part of a much wider problem of political risk in Cuba. Now, uh, what do I mean by that? Well, I think if you're going to talk about the Cuban economy, you recognize it's fraught with political risk, but you have to recognize that these unresolved property claims are just one of several classes of potential legal claims that cast clouds on title in terms of property and exchange. The claims, the most you know, the most uh, well-known claims are the ones that have been certified by the U.S. Claims Commission programs, and even then there are a couple of different kinds of claims. Uh, there's also a public international law claim of Cuba against the U.S. based on uh, embargo losses. There's also, Cuba also has a small claim of the U.S. against, uh, um, uh, against Cuba for a loan issued by the Export-Import Bank, but given that Congress may have been able to decertify that bank, maybe the claim will go away. There are also potential private claims against third parties created by Helms-Burton, Title III, which has been suspended serially since it was enacted, so it's not, uh, it's not actually um, it's not a, a live claim yet. And I also think there's a third category of claims. It doesn't exist yet, but I think it's coming because I think D-17 created a context for it. And that is uh, uh, lawsuits challenging the constitutionality of Helms-Burton. And I just want to spend a moment on this because Helms-Burton is an important source of political risk in Cuba. And, 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 and what I want to emphasize is that what D-17 does is it makes it imperative that we now pay attention to the constitutional defects of Helms-Burton. Because until now, it's been easy to not think about this because there was alignment between the executive and Congress about the embargo, no more. So now I want us to engage in a thought experiment to try to understand what is the current status, what does Helms-Burton really require? And I want to, and this is how, I don't have the answer to that yet, but I think I have a way of thinking about how to get to that answer, and it's the following thought experiment. As most of you know, uh, the embargo lives in regulations that are enacted by the Office of Foreign Assets Control, which is a, a Bureau of Treasury, OFAC. And, um, and OFAC, like any other federal agency, can reverse their regulations following the Administrative Procedure Act. Now, uh, to implement a cha this change in executive policy about of Cuba, assume that OFAC repeals all existing regulations. They can do that. They have to follow notice and comment procedure. They can't do that unilaterally, but, and it takes some time. But they, can, they could decide tomorrow, we've decided to abolish all the regulations. Okay, now, what they would immediately encounter is that Helms-Burton created a legislative mandate, a statutory mandate that certain rules be enacted. And so what OFAC would have to do is, it would have to then say, okay, what is the, uh, the legislative mandate to create an embargo? Not the executive mandate, because it no longer exists. But in other words, we, because what you have is a hostile executive and a, and a Congress that wants this. What must we do? The question that OFAC would encounter, the question that would be encountered in lit litigation is, well, how much authority does Congress have over this kind of international issue? That's a largely unresolved question. And I defer to the other experts on, on the panel uh, on, 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 uh, for any of this. Because what our Constitution does is it divides authority over foreign affairs between the executive and, uh, and the Congress. The executive is the principal actor. Congress has some authority. And what Congress tried to do in Helms-Burton is take a snapshot and freeze the embargo. What's wrong with that is, ma is that much of the embargo is predicated on executive orders and executive authority that Congress doesn't have. 
So I think there's an authority deficit between executive and congressional authority. And so that means that when OFAC in this hypothetical thought experiment enacts minimum standards, they're going to prohibit many fewer things. But we don't know what they are. Now, and I think an analogy is sort of, uh, and, I, and I think you don't have to wait for Congress to act. They're not going to, because you have federal courts to resolve this question. And the gay marriage example is an example, because what you saw there was an executive that said, you know what, we're not, we don't think this federal law, law DOMA is constitutional anymore. We're not defending it. And so what you saw was the collapse of that law. So that's my helms Burton thought experiment. Okay. Now I'm going to move into my third strategy, which is, well, apart from, um, if you're going to think about these unresolved property claims, what else is at stake in the Cuban economy that we should think of in terms of political risk? And what I want to identify are not, this is not, I'm not going to, going to articulate a mechanism that should be, that should be, I don't have a mechanism. What I have are, I think of as, you know, they're prerequisites, they're meta criteria, they're background assumptions that I think are pretty much necessary assumptions if any kind of mechanism is going to go forward. And so these are the interests, uh, the meta, meta criteria that any effective mechanism is going to have, to have to promote. And I think there are four, and I'll explain what each of these is. First, uh, any mechanism has to promote sovereign bilateralism, create legal finality, recognize the dignitarian interests at stake in Cuba, and put public interests over private ones. Now, what do I mean about sovereign bilateralism? Well, I think as a foundational premise, you have to see Cuba and the United States as legal and moral equals in terms of public international law. Moral in quotation marks because Countries have interests, not friends. Countries aren't moral entities, but insofar as they're moral or immoral, Cuba and the U.S. are equal when it comes to this issue. So that means you have to reject the view that Cuba's sovereignty is suspect or defective because uh, it's too late for that. We've already crossed the Rubicon, okay? Now, there are ongoing disputes about sovereignty between the two governments, and that's typical. So that's, that's the first interest that I think has to be promoted. The second is what I think of, you have to create, you know, any resolution has to create legal finality. Now, uh, you know, the problem with political risk is it looks backward at what happened and it looks forward fearfully at the thought that something like that might happen again. So legal finality li has to liquidate these unresolved claims. Some people will welcome the settlement, some won't, but they have to be convinced that there's no legal appeal. The issue's resolved, res judicata. Now, by extinguishing expectations about things turning out differently, legal finality should promote emotional finality, which is a very different thing. But I think one is, uh, is relevant to the other. Okay, now, uh, there are a couple, I could say, I just wanna say a couple of issues about this. One is, one of the, one of the structural issues is, should large claimants be allowed to make one-off deals or should all claimants be consolidated in, uh, in a common pool? I think the pool method is better, and I think a good way to think of it is uh, bankrupt how bankruptcy estates work in this country, where you have a mechanism for dealing with scarce resources. Okay, the second is uh, recognizing dignitarian interests. Now for many, maybe most, probably most, Cubans in diaspora, uh, property wasn't the most valuable thing they left behind, thank you. What they left behind was a set of intangibles called culture, family, way of life that are gone forever and that can't really be replaced. Now, because claims have been reduced to a dollar value, these claims, they create an illusion that you can be made whole. You can't. So I think part of what restitution, uh, so, so restitution claims stand in for these other losses and I think they have to be acknowledged. I don't know how many of you have seen the, the movie Woman in Gold, but it's about a related issue about a, a woman who, whose family owned what is probably my favorite painting, Gustav Klimt's portrait of Adele Block Bauer, sues the Austrian government. I don't want to see that movie because I know I will sit there and seethe because of the way that it ennobles a private uh, recovery of property. What she then does is she, 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 she gets the painting, the movie doesn't talk about this, sells it for $135 million, and, uh, and, and, and that's that. So, but that, 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 that film touches on a, a related set of things. Okay, um, I only have a couple of minutes, so I think to promote dignitarian interests, you have to have some kind of reconciliation process. There have been different attempts at this. FIU had something called the National Reconciliation Process a few years ago. I think that was 
that that kind of thing is, uh, is necessary. And by reconciliation, I, I, I mean, there has to be some way by which island Cubans and diaspora Cubans in the U.S. and elsewhere find a new modus vivendi that takes account of the past without being bound by it. Um, finally, I, I think that you, you, you have to recognize that public interests have to trump private ones, probably for quite some time. And, and by that, I, I, I think, you, you know, it's, you're going to need a rule of decision because there will be conflicts because what's in, what's, uh, what's in someone's private interest and what's in a public interest. I think the rule of decision should favor public interests, but there's a contradiction here, and that is that one of Cuba's most important public interests, I think, is to create, reinforce, and nurture institutions of private property and capitalism. So that is a pro that's a, that's a, that's a public project in Cuba, but it should be understood as a public project, not an entirely private one. So I want to hear what you think. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Jose. Next, we have uh, Matias Travieso Diaz. Good morning. Can you hear me? OK, fine. Uh, the title of my paper is Resolving U.S. Expropriation Claims Against Cuba, a very modest proposal. I have a few extra copies of the paper here in case you would like to have one after the meeting is over. Uh, I came to my first meeting of ASCII in 1992, and shortly thereafter, I presented my first paper on this subject. In the intervening 20 years, many papers have been written, including by myself and others, on the claims issue, and nothing has been done about it. In fact, claims, in a way, is like the weather. Everybody talks about it, but nobody does anything about it. So I decided that this year I was going to do something slightly different. I was going to submit for your consideration a very modest way, approach, in which the claims could be resolved. And I don't, I don't claim, I don't, um, I don't pretend that this is the only way, but I'm just trying to get people thinking as to how to do it instead of saying what a big problem it is. Now, I, my, the, the subject of this presentation is very restricted and limited. I'm not talking about the claims that were presented by uh, U.S. nationals and were not accepted or were not presented. I'm not talking about the claims of Cuban Americans, who, whether U.S. citizens now or not, for properties they lost in Cuba. I'm not going to talk about the claims of Cubans abroad or Cubans in the island. Those are very important or separate subjects that need to be addressed. The universe of claims that I'm going to be talking about is specifically the claims that were presented by a process established by the U.S. government in 1964 for people who were U.S. nationals at the time the properties were taken by Cuba. And as a result of that process, claims were certified as valid. The Foreign Claims Settlement Commission of the U.S. was given the mandate to determine the validity and amount of those claims. A total of 5,911 claims were certified and those are the ones that I'm going to be talking about. Why am I limiting myself to that subject? Well, there are both legal and practical reasons why this particular family of claims needs to be addressed, and hopefully needs to be addressed in the context of facilitating, whenever it happens, a um, normalization of economic relations between the U.S. and Cuba. First reason, is a legal reason, uh, Gabilondo has touched on it. There are a number of U.S. laws that impose a trade embargo and establish sanctions against people who do business on Cuba on property that was confiscated. And in order for the embargo to be lifted, a necessary but not necessarily sufficient condition is that the expropriation claims of certified claimants is resolved somehow. And then there's the practical issue again that those, the existence of those unresolved claims creates clouds on the potential title of property in which people may want to invest in Cuba, and a, therefore is an obstacle to foreign investment. So that's another reason why 
apart from the fact that justice requires it and all, many other good, good, good and moral reasons for doing it. But it's a practical step that needs to be taken whenever the parties are ready to do it to permit or facilitate the reestablishment of normal economic relations between the U.S. and Cuba. Now, they, uh, I am not going to describe the expropriation uh, of properties in Cuba. I'll mention it, as you probably know, starting in 1959, the Cuban government took over first agricultural properties, and in, in 1960, they passed Law 851, in which most American on properties in Cuba were confiscated, and later on they proceeded. By, by the early mid 1960s, everything that was owned privately by an American and then by a Cuban was taken over by the government, exceptions being small farms, personal property, and so on. Now, what are we going to do with these 5,911 claims? First thing you need to understand is that not all claims are created equal. There are small claims and big claims. In reality, if you analyze what was certified, of the 5,911 claims, there were only 48 claims whose certified value was in excess of $5 million. There were only 131 claims with the certified value was in excess of $1 million. In other words, the universe of these certified claims consists of a very large number of small claims and a very small number of large claims, mostly by corporations, okay? The fact that you have these two different universes, if you will, of claimants, suggests that there could be an approach that takes into account the size and the nature of the claimants as opposed to trying to paint with a broad brush. Now, what has the U.S. done in the past to resolve claims against nations that have expropriated U.S. property? It is a well-established constitutional law principle that the president of the U.S. has the authority to negotiate and resolve claims against foreign countries for expropriation of U.S. national properties. It's also well established that the State Department, as an agency of the U.S. government, has the authority and the mandate to negotiate such a settlement. And it's also well established so far that under what is called the doctrine of spousal, the State Department has the sole authority to negotiate the claims, distribute the proceeds among the claimants, and no claimant can, on its own, try to contest or go beyond or outside what the State Department has done. How can we apply that to Cuba? Well, it's a problem because the amount of the certified claims in 1960 dollars was $1.9 billion. The Foreign Saint Claim Settlement Commission was giving the authority to assess simple interest at the rate of 6% on the certified claims. If you were to apply that interest rate, you have claims now in amount that is around $8 billion today. It's not only that Cuban doesn't want to pay such an amount, it's that it couldn't even if it wanted to. So the uh, standard approach to resolving claims as the U.S. has done with other countries will fail in the case of Cuba simply by the nature of the claims. You probably will know, and if you don't, I'm telling you, the Cuban claims exceed the combined amount of all the claims against all the countries that have been certified and resolved by the U.S. So if you take that into consideration, we're talking about a very, very large claim, and you add interest on top of that, it is just a fairly significant amount of money. Also, you have to, um, Take into account that normally what the State Department does is when they settle claims, they are able to recover a fraction, a few cents on the dollar on the amount that is at, um, in controversy or certified. So again, you're going to apply that to Cuba. The people who have small claims will get practically nothing. The people who have the big claims still get pretty little. Okay, so my, uh, my proposed solution to that is what I call the Cuban Ajiaco, 
Do you know what an ajiaco is? And for those of you who don't know, an ajiaco is a stew that is made out of a combination of various root vegetables like malanga, boniato, malanga, yuca, and various meats. And you throw into the pot whatever you have at hand. Okay, I'm going to propose an ajiaco. And this ajiaco is going to have three ingredients or three steps. The first ingredient is we have 5,811 claimants with small claims that you're talking about a million dollars or less. For those people, you could resolve those claims and give them 100% of the principal, no interest, but 100% of the interest at the cost of $164 million. It's a big sum, but not in the billions, so multiple billions. There is even potentially, and I want to underscore potentially, money available to pay for those claims because the U.S. has frozen Cuban assets which, whose amount varies with the year. Right now, as of last year, last year that we have figures for, there were $271 million in frozen Cuban assets. Now, the availability of those funds is A, hypothetical, and be in dispute. First, because they may, those, those frozen assets may not be Cuban, may be earmarked for Cuba by third parties, but not necessarily Cuban. And second, they are also potentially subject to claims by people who have court judgments against Cuba and so on. So it is even devoting that money to pay for the 5,811 claims uh, to satisfy those, it is not going to be an easy process. But at least in theory, it is a much simpler thing than trying to come up with $8 billion or $2 billion. So my first component of the HIACO is try to resolve by payment of as close to 100% of the certified amount to the 5811, the 90% of the claims that are individuals who lost houses, who lost small properties, small industries. That would be the HIACO that will have the most meat in it. The second is allow, which has, is not possible now on the practice, but, but with the U.S. who had to make a commitment to let it happen, allow the people with the big claims to negotiate directly with Cuba to find a resolution that would meet their needs, that would be acceptable. There are only one caveat to that, two caveats to that. First, door negotiation would have to be sponsored by the U.S. government so that there will be a possibility at the end, if the negotiation fails, for the U.S. to be able to advance the claim of these people in the third step, which we'll get to in a minute. What can the people, what can the people who have those 48 or 90 claimants that have large claims do with Cuba or seek to do? There are many potential resolutions. We talk about restitution. Uh, probably in most cases it wouldn't work, but it's also a possibility. Restitution both directly of the property they lost or restitution in kind by getting instead of the property something equivalent. Uh, the, another potential ingredient in the Ajiaco would be getting vouchers, essentially IOUs of the Cuban government that could be used for a number of purposes such as buying state properties, uh, the, the decreasing tax, tax, tax obligations, a, a, num a, a number of things that you can do with that. Both restitution and the voucher system have been employed successfully in other privatization efforts, in other claim resolution efforts in other countries. The third, of course, would be whatever deal is most advantageous to the claimant and that Cuba would agree with. For example, getting tax breaks going for a long time, giving investment preferences. There are many things that you may want if you are a potential investor to do, but those will require that you make a commitment to invest in Cuba, which may be to Cuba's benefit as well as to the climate. But in any event, those, uh, that ajiaco is the most complex because you can put into it whatever you're able to get your hands on. So you can put, you know, malanga, or you don't have malanga, you could put yuca, and so on. At the end of the day, that is probably what many of the big claimants want. I do not believe that Coca-Cola wants to get restitution, reimbursement of its plant in Cuba that was obsolete in 1960, let alone today. I'm sure that, that, that ESO, now Exxon, wants to get back the refinery that they had in 1960. 
I doubt very much that that will work. So for them, probably some kind of method that allows them to get an advantage in going back doing business in Cuba would be the best way of solving it. Now, it is possible, in fact, it is likely that in some instances, this second component of the Ajiaco wouldn't work because they couldn't get the claimant to come to terms with Cuba for whatever reason. That is where the U.S. starts to step in. They had to agree with Cuba in advance to establish a mechanism for international settlement of claims by internationally binding arbitration. I don't have time to get into what that would consist of. There has been written. I and others have written about what that arbitration would be like. But there are mechanisms under which those claims could be submitted to an international tribunal, and Cuba will have to be prepared and willing to abide by the decision of the tribunal. So that's my very simple approach. I have to tell you that there is no solution to the claims problem given the status of relations between the U.S. and Cuba, the economic condition of Cuba, and the multiplicity of problems that are going to be before both countries when the effort is made to normalize relations, that's going to be possible to do it in a simple way. But this is the simplest way that I can come up with, and I hope it's given some consideration uh, by the people who had to make those decisions, and hopefully that will happen sometime, maybe in my lifetime, if not, if not later. But thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Rolando Anillo. Good morning, and um, thank you for the invitation and for this opportunity to share with a distinguished panelist. And uh, this is a great opportunity. And, and, and the topic today, of course, of claims is very, um, uh, is very, uh, I think, hot <laughs> right now. Um, um, I would try to read as much as I can because the whole purpose of my presentation is to try to answer some of the questions that some of members. Uh, the community has uh, been asking for many, many years, and I will try to do my best to answer some of those questions. And then, we, of course, we're going to try to uh, do some uh, exercise in identifying who are the actual claimants as of today, and the many reasons why these uh, actors are no longer involved in the debate of getting uh, in this process. Uh, as everybody, you know, uh, know, the, for political and, real, um, and legal reasons, uh, the U.S. will not end embargo if, if the claims are not settled. Uh, for Cuban government, it is also important. I think it's important to be recognized as a reformist government, but also it's important to attract the $8 billion investment portfolio that they are uh, publishing and trying to get it through uh, all over the places. Um, I believe that a prone and widely accepted resolution of the claim is very important and is a prerequisite for a successful privat privatization in Cuba in the future. Um, let's go to the question. Um, we heard about certified claims. I won't repeat that. It's property. What they have is a right of compensation. Is there a U.S. property in Cuba? The Cuban government will say immediately, no. And I'm going to uh, try to answer the best I can. Uh, based on, on U.S. Constitution and also based on Foreign Claims Settlement Commission decision on the, the Cuban uh, um, Claims Act. Uh, the concept of property for purpose of the Fifth Amendment has been interpreted broadly and can include any sort of interest the citizen may possess. Therefore, claims for compensation are generally considered to grant a property interest to claimants and constitute a property in which Cuba has an interest. For this authority, it appears that a claimant's interest will be recognized as property for purpose of the Fifth Amendment unless the interest is devoid of a legally enforceable right or recognition of a property interest will contravene public policy. Under this standard, 
the claims against Cuba amounts to the rights over properties that are subject to the claims. The U.S. has consistently taken the view that foreign governments are entitled to confiscate property belonging to U.S. nationals. However, the United States has also consistently maintained that such a taking must be accompanied by appropriate compensation. According to the Foreign Claim Settlement Commission, Q and Proran, the properties owned by U.S. claimants in Cuba were declared a loss, and that all the tangible assets, cash, property, land, and equipment in Cuba were converted into a claim, which is certified in terms of money damages owned by the Cuban government and did not purport to represent interest in or to be secured by any particular property real or personal, tangible or intangible, situated in Cuba or owned or possessed by the Cuban government or Cuban nationals. Therefore, a U.S. certified claim is a just in action, an intangible personal property right recognized and protected by the law, which has no existence apart from recognition given by the law, but which not confers, not present possession of a tangible object. The certified claims owned by U.S. certified claimants are therefore property, personal property rights, representing an obligation for compensation owed to U.S. persons holding the claims by the Cuban government. It is assumed that the Cuba state currently holds title on all confiscated properties previously owned by U.S. certified claimants. Okay, second question that is more related to the Cuban nationals. Is restitution of residential properties feasible? There are some legal and, and, and social aspects. But I will try to answer uh, basically what happened uh, during the debate of the helms borton first. The helms borton as you know, which is uh, codified the regulations, excludes from the definition of property most residential real property which was a necessary accommodation to avoid fears of dispossession or incurring liability simply by occupying a residence. Pursuant to the Health Borton, if there is a restitution, it may be granted without adversely impacting innocent and third parties, excluding members of the Communist Party or U.S. certified claimants. Basically, an ordinary Cuban citizen living in a resident previously owned by a Cuban national may not face a risk of depossession or personal liability under the Helms Borton. This is the most difficult uh, and challenging uh, on all the confiscation of the confiscated property. The mitigating factor here in terms of U.S. certified claimants, there are a few. Uh, basically, the properties were occupied by Cuban nationals. Some of them are present here today. The guiding principle should be that an occupant of a resident, residential property for a number of years under a claim of good title should not be dispossessed of his or her property. Good title is in effect, in Cuba, is, is, is claiming various laws in Cuba, including the, civil, the Spanish Civil Code that was still in place in Cuba until 1988, which basically is the, the legal principle of usucapio that we know as adverse possession, which basically says that any person that having a good title and being uh, public and physical and, 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 and uh, possessing the property is entitled to that. And we know right now the Cuba law just uh, made some amendments to the law and this property can be freely transferred to other third parties. Okay, the other question, are these, cu these counterclaims by the Cuban government legitimate on in under international law? As you know, uh, Cuba has a large counterclaim of about $180 billion for a leg damage and harp caused to the Cuban economy and to the individual Cuban citizens by over five decades of U.S. trade and investment embargo. Cuba argues that the embargo has been an economic warfare for which a form of rip The best possible solution is to settle this claim, legitimate or not. 
with a comprehensive financial assistance package to Cuba. Such plan may include the lifting of the embargo, resuming U.S. foreign aid, reinsertion of Cuba into the World Bank, IMF, and International Inter-American Development Bank for accessibility of needed capital. For the Cubans, an open economy, rule of law, transparency, and high standard protection and guarantee for the investor are needed. The entry into U.S.-Cuba bilateral investment treaty will be the ultimate goal. Now, let's talk briefly about default judgments. Uh, what is the burden for future Cuban governments? It's huge. One claim only uh, is about $3 billion. Uh, Cuba was included in the list of terrorist countries from 1982 to, to just recently. Uh, uh, that it was uh, removed from the list. In 1996, uh, the Foreign Sovereign Immunity Act was amended, and they opened the possibility to uh, 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 sue the Cuban government for the uh, uh, cause of act of torture, extrajudicial killing, aircraft sabotage, hostage taking, and provision of material support or resources made by an official employee or agent of Cuba. The first judgment under this new modification was related to the deliberate shooting down of the two civilian aircraft operating by brothers to rescue. That judgment, judgment, default judgment was about 188 million in compensatory and punitive damages. There are no really frozen assets in, in, in the U.S. to take from this one. There is a new approach in how to get this resolved. The new approach is between the U.S. Department of Justice, with certain way, the uh, uh, help of the U.S. Uh, to use some of the money uh, in, that has been uh, fines and penalty from uh, international banks uh, we know that the French bank has a penalty, a huge penalty of a billion dollar, to probably get on a case-by-case -case basis to settle these claims. That's a part of negotiation today. Um, let's see if I can move quicker here. I think it's important to talk about this. Okay, now, is the president has the right to enter into a settlement agreement on a bilateral investment treaty with Cuba? Okay. Three possibilities. There is an executive treaty. So the president has the power to enter into a settlement agreement with Cuba based on the convention uh, because Cuba and the U.S. are you know, parties on the Vienna Convention of the Laws of the Treaty. So the president can do it. But uh, the president's decision and entering into an agreement may be challenged in court. The Article 2 of Constitution requires for the president to have two-thirds of the Senate approving a treaty. And the third one is going to be a congressional executive agreement where the president and the Congress will uh, discuss a potential agreement and will require majority approval. That one may be the most comprehensive, but it may take years to get this done. Now, I want to talk about the, uh, I think, let me go back for a moment. Okay, before we go enter into discussing pretty much, I think there are two important things here, principles that are important in, in this negotiation that are happening right now. The, con the, the uh, continuity uh, nationality of the claimant, just to make this very simple, the law requires that the person that has certified the claim has to be U.S. national at the time of the expropriation, at the time of the certification, and the time of the settlement any U.S. certified claim that has been transferred to foreign entities is disqualified for compensation on a government-to-government -government negotiation because the U.S. government will not represent interests of a foreign in this type of negotiation. The anti-speculation anti clause, the Cuban Claims Act, is very clear that any person that purchases a certified claim uh, legally or with a license is only entitled to receive the consideration, what they pay for that claim. The people that have been buying claims for many years, that we saw a few of them, 
uh, will be entitled to receive what they pay for it. OFA was very clear in 2008. That's called the anti-speculation clause. In 2008, OFA said very clear that a license is required to transfer claims unless by operational law, inheritance, there is a, a clear transfer from family to f members of the family. Valuation, okay. Um, it doesn't matter if it is $1.9 or $1 billion. Uh, <laughs> what is important here that the value is what is gonna be able to negotiate on a table. If it is 100 million, if it's 200 million, if it is $7 billion. So basically, valuation is irrelevant, even though that has been certified. But it was certified by ex parte, no adversarial contestant. The agricultural land in Cuba, they didn't, couldn't estimate the value. In some cases, it, it doubled the value of the land. Put it this way, uh, United Fruit acquired 200,000 acres of land at $1 per acre. Of course, a, a little over 100 years, but still, uh, that's... that's Tax deduction, the Cuban government thinks that because some of the claimant got tax reduction, uh, they are no longer entitled to represent uh, in the negotiation, this is the US government, that's wrong. Tax deduction was on a strategy, it was for 20 years, a lot of company transferred uh, the asset to other corporations to take advantage of those tax deduction. But doesn't mean that, uh, that the Cuban, let's, let's go this one pretty quick. This is the 20 most, uh, first 20, I put 19 because I combine ITT. Just pretty quick. Q Electric Company right now is a staple, you know, successor of Office Depot. I mean, Q Electric staple, doesn't really make any sense. ITT received already $25 million for the use of the, the Cuban uh, comp telecommunication company. Now, Starwood Hotels is the owner of that claim and Starwood owns Melia Hotels in Spain. So Starwood will be no interest in, in getting 130 million. Maybe they're gonna be some interest in Cuba with acquiring Melia Hotels. The other one, all the, sh the majority of the sugar industry has been transferred to private companies that are really no longer in, in existence anymore. So basically, I don't have more time, but I would say that on a case-by-case -case analysis, very simple, very straightforward. A lot of this will be disqualified. A lot of this has, will be reduced substantially. And some of them, as, re, um, as a Professor uh, uh, Travieso uh, mentioned, they may have the option to say, why am I gonna get Coca-Cola $27 million when I can get that in one year after lifting the embargo? And that's about it, I don't have more time. Thank you so much. Good morning. Um, after hearing thought experiments and uh, claim lists and statutes and so forth, I thought that I would change the format a little bit. And being Cuban and being a Cuban American, I think that the foundational analytical viewpoint for Cuban American reality is mythology. So. With your permission, I'm gonna tell you a fairy tale. And I hope this fairy tale will come out in the Huffington Post uh, in my next posting. And it goes like this. Once upon a time, there was a beautiful little castle. The people who lived in the little castle were by and large happy, but they were not very good at choosing kings and kept revolting against their rulers and installing new kings who promised to be better rulers. One day, a young, handsome, bearded rebel led the peoples in revolt. He promised to be a really good ruler forever, and he was crowned king. As it turned out, he wasn't a very nice king at all. He beat and bullied them, and he had people executed. Those he did not like, he threw out of the little castle. They were cast out, and the big drawbridge was lifted, and they had to fend for themselves. These people, I'll call them the outcasts, were at a loss as to what to do. But soon, 90 miles away, 
they saw this enormous castle, a beautiful castle, a very rich castle, and they decided to make their way there. Upon arrival, they were welcomed with open arms by the people who lived in the big castle. I would call them the kindly folk. The kindly folk, many with pink skin and blue eyes, and others with dark skin and brown eyes, took them in. Soon, the outcasts realized that the big castle was, by and large, very well ruled, for the kind folks had a knack for picking rulers and good rules to keep them in line. As time went by, the outcasts tried time and time again to retake the little castle, sometimes using old discarded weapons that the kindly folk gave to them. But alas, they were unsuccessful. Unable to take the little castle by force of arms, they laid siege to it with the help of the kindly folk from the big castle. They closed off the bridge over the moat and they made sure that no one could enter the little castle by the main gate. The subjects of the Bat King who ruled the little castle hurled insults at the outcasts from the towers and parapets, and the outcasts shouted back in kind and vowed not to lift the siege until the Bat King died or was overthrown. Curiously, the outcasts were incapable of closing off all the entrance to the little castles so that its inhabitants were truly besieged. Even more curiously, they kept sending supplies to the inhabitants of the little castle so they wouldn't suffer too much from the siege. And at any time, any time any of the inhabitants of the little castle fled, they were warmly welcomed by the outcasts and the kindly folks and taken into the big castle. And so the years and decades went by and the outcasts and their children and their children's children kept up the virtual siege and continued to hurl insults at the folks in the little castle who insulted them back in return. And so it came to pass that after 54 years had gone by, the new king of the big castle, a gentleman with brown skin and brown eyes, realized that nothing much had been accomplished and decided to stop the siege. Some of the outcasts realized that nothing was really stopping them from going back to the little castle, and so they went to see how things were. When they got inside, a curious sight met their eyes and a curious feeling assailed their hearts. The Bat King hadn't died. He had simply grown very, very old. He wasn't ruling anymore. The new ruler was the new king's younger brother, but not, not much younger. That brother was tired of ruling, tired of beating people up and bullying them, although he continued to do so. And he wanted to trade with the kindly folk in the big castle. The little castle had not been well kept by the Bat King. It was shabby and decrepit, although still quite charming. And the inhabitants, the relatives of the outcasts who stayed behind, were the sweetest people in the world. And those people inside, their children and their children's children, curiously harbored no ill will towards the outcasts and the kindly folks in the big castle. I'm almost done. And so it was that in the end, many of the outcasts came to realize that with the passage of all those years, they had been transformed, and they themselves had become kindly folk. And they liked the big castle much better than the little castle. And at the end of the story, that has been true at the beginning of the story, it was the people inside the little castle who had to figure out all by themselves how to find a good king. The question remains as to whether they will all live happily ever after. When you look at Cuba and the US from the point of view of mythology and the very complicated relationships that we have had, you begin to understand how is it that we came to be where we are after 54 years. It is not easy to understand. And I use this very simplistic fairy tale to illustrate and to highlight the very core problems that we faced at the beginning of this process and some of the realities that we're facing now. Which allows me to segue into the serious part of my presentation, which is this thing that we have created, and it is our creation, it's a Cuban-American creation, which is the hardwiring of the embargo. As you have heard, the issue of claims is one of the key components of this. And this sets up a political battle that is going to be forthcoming in the US Congress. And I wanted to take a quick look at that. 
It's been nine years since Fidel passed uh, the ruling of Cuba over to Raul. On February of 2013, Raul Castro announced that he will not seek re-election in 2018, and Miguel Diaz-Canel apparently is the heir uh, forthcoming after he retires, although I will tell you that the job of heir apparent in Cuba is a dangerous one, and you can ask Mr. Perez Roque or Mr. Robaina the, the types of dangers that that incurs. So whether it is Diaz-Canel or not is still open for conversation. The Cuban Americans on their side have a number of political players, and I, I think we need to take a quick look at them. Senator Cruz, he's trying to figure out whether he's a Cuban American or a Canadian. Uh, <laughs> Senator Rubio and Representative Diaz Balart are very conservative. Uh, Representative Garcia is new to the game. Uh, Ileana Rosleden is holding the line, and Senator Menendez is otherwise occupied at the time. But, that's the lineup, uh, that's the bullpen for the Cuban-American side. This is kind of the core slide of what I want to talk about, and this is the order of battle in what is going to be happening in the U.S. Congress vis-a-vis -vis the embargo. And then I'll tell you a little bit later on about the hardwiring aspect of the embargo. On the side of maintaining the status quo are the conservative Cuban-American political interests, which we just saw. And the dilemma that they have is that their popular base of support is slowly eroding. They still have a tremendous amount of monetary support and they have a hard core of conservative supporters who get out the vote, make the contributions, mobilize people and so forth. So they're still very much of a formidable force. But on the other side, you have a lineup coming in of the travel industry, the hospitality industry, agricultural industry, pharmaceuticals, energy and infrastructure. And in a nutshell, I wanted to summarize the strategy of these two groups. The strategy of the conservative lobby for the Cuban-American community is let's delay and hope that the other side, side screws up, the other side being the Cuban government. And, and I'll show you an example of how they're perfectly capable of doing that in a moment. And the strategy of the other side, the people who want to have opening the embargo, is what I call the salami approach, which is let's slice this up like a salami. And the first piece of the salami that's up for grabs, and I think the first one that will fall, is travel, because that's a no-brainer. That's the easiest one of all to pitch. That's the one that doesn't require the settlement of claims. That's the one that has all the infrastructure on this side ready to go. And that's the one that Cuba will welcome with open arms very, very quickly. And it's already underway. Cuba has some challenges itself. The population growth in Cuba has been declining. It has an aging population and has a very heavy social welfare charge. So they also need to understand what it is that is coming their way. And they need to, and I think they've already done so, they need to start positioning themselves for negotiating a solution to the ongoing problem, one of the issues having to be the claims. Along these lines, the Cubans, I think, have realized that they need to do something about their economy first and foremost. So they went into a series of lineamientos by the party congress uh, of the Communist Party a few years ago. And basically what they've done is they've, they've made a small opening in private economy. And I won't bore you with that. I've just been given the five minute warning and I want to get to the hard wire solution. But you already know that the Cuban economy has a very modest, very slow process of uh, opening up to the private sector. Uh, how the Cuban government can mess up is the Chong Chong affair, and you remember that sort of tragic comic situation where a derelict North Korean freighter was stopped in the Panama Canal, and under a bunch of sugar, uh, they found a bunch of MiGs uh, uh, going to North Korea. Uh, this was an issue in the United Nations embargo and so forth, and that's the type of scenario that can happen uh, that can trigger uh, an adverse reaction in, in the U.S. and can play right into the strategic hands of the conservative lobby. Let's talk for a moment about the hard wire list. Helms-Burton has two sets of criteria, one for a Cuban transitional government and one for a Cuban democratically elected government. The bar is set very high. For a transitional government, the definition is a government that has legalized all political activity, released all politi political prisoners and allowed for inspection of jails, dissolved state security, made public commitment to free and fair elections, ceased interfering with Radio and TV Marti, and made 
public commitment and demonstrable progress in establishing an independent judiciary, respecting human rights, and allowing the establishment of free trade unions. And here's the most interesting one, it names names. Neither Fidel nor Raul can be in the government. I think Fidel is no longer an issue, and Raul will likely not be one very soon, and has given adequate assurance that they will allow the speedy and efficient distribution of assistance to the Cuban people. That's transition. Democratically elected is which, in addition to meeting the prior requirements, results from free and fair elections, so now you need to have a freely elected government, shows respect for basic civil liberties and human rights, is substantially moving towards a market-oriented economic system, it's committed to making constitutional changes to ensure free and fair elections and human rights, and has made demonstrable progress in uh, independent, uh, establishing an independent judiciary, and to segue into what we heard earlier in the presentations, has made progress towards returning confiscated property to U.S. citizens or providing full compensation of such property in accordance with international law standards of practices. So the thing to remember here is that the standards under Helms-Burton are extremely high, extremely difficult to meet. Uh, I, I would posit that there are very few governments in Latin America that meet these criteria as it stands today. So what are the issues to be parsed out? The policy interests of the United States in the regions are stability, control of immigration, trade, national security, and stopping drug trafficking. We're going to face competing interests and existing investments from Spain, Mexico, Venezuela, and Russia. The Cuban national interest, by Cuban national interest, I mean Cuban nationals like us, whether we're Cuban Americans or Cubans. For the Cubans on the island, stability, a better life, economic prosperity, housing, health and education, Sovereignty, vindication, no vendettas and family ties. For us, opportunity to help, justice, a return to the island, perhaps political standing, vindication, closure, and family ties. For any future Cuban government, the agenda has to be a consolidation of power, legitimacy, international recognition, reassuring its, its constituency, economic progress, guaranteeing health and education, generating goodwill, and access to financing, and it needs to balance equity, justice, and pragmatism. The conclusions on Cuba are, it's not, there's no democratic transition yet. They take one step forwards and two step back sometimes, ongoing repression. There seems to be a commitment to uh, single party rule and collective rule, and there seems to be a real effort to reconvert state capitalism, but it faces multiple and complex challenges. I will finish with a quote from Winston Churchill, and please don't leave the room saying that Pedro Freire said that Raul Castro is Winston Churchill. But Winston Churchill said, upon being appointed Prime Minister of Britain in 1940, I have not been appointed Her Majesty's Prime Minister to preside over the dissolution of the British Empire. Raul Castro said almost the exact words, I have not accepted being president to preside over the dissolution of the Cuban Revolution. Time will tell and history will have the verdict. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm, uh, my uh, job here is to talk about the presentations that were made, uh, basically having to do with the uh, real estate issues and the situation with the claims um, about real estate, which is part of what we're um, talking about here. Um, I have been dealing with real estate issues in Cuba for more than 20 years, and I'll explain a little bit about that, so I, I know a little bit about this. One of the things that, that uh, uh, I would like to ask, and I asked this question uh, at a meeting at the University of Miami some time ago, how many here know that there were condominiums sold in Havana in the 1990s? Okay, that, that is more or less what I expected, that five people said or four people said. Uh, look, I'm, I'm just trying to inform, <laughs> and, and that is pathetic, frankly. I, 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 
if you're going to talk about, about uh, the situation in Cuba, so you have to understand what's going on and what's happening. How many here know that they are now, and they've been actually for the last ten, more than 10 years, a group of large developments that are supposed to be developed by companies in uh, different places, uh, China, uh, Canada, and others, uh, big developments with uh, condominiums and marinas and golf courses, hotels, and all that. How many people here know about that? One, two, three, four, five. Okay, more, actually, more than the condominiums. That's, that's good. That's, uh, that's very good. That, uh, I like that. Uh, look, the, the situation that both um, uh, presenters that I'm uh, talking about, uh, Anillo, um, and, and of course, uh, Professor, um, my colleague at uh, FIU, um, both are talking about these, the claims, the claims between the United States um, and uh, Cuba. And, and those claims have to be analyzed also from the perspective of what is real and what is not real. One of the issues is that the certified claims, which are there, uh, and they should be somehow um, paid, uh, resolved, or what have you, those certified claims have been there for a long, long time. In the meantime, Cuba has settled their claims with every country in the world. So there, there is an argument that, that why has uh, the United States and Cuba settled the issue of the claims when Cuba has settled with the entire world? There's one exception in Spain. There's a group in Spain who claims that they don't accept the agreement between Spain and, and Cuba. But basically, all the claims have been, have been settled. So that, that's one issue. And they, they, it was described very well by Anillo and so on and, uh, um, uh, in his presentation. What do we do about those claims? Well, I think they should be. Uh, resolve. This is one of the issues that obviously is going to be in the, in the future negotiations between Cuba and the United States that are now ongoing. Uh, they have to settle this. And I, I'm all for some sort of settlement of this, of, of this issue. Now, is it going to be 10 percent, 20 percent, 5 percent, or no percent? Uh, that's another thing that has to be decided. But it has to be resolved. The issue of claims have to be resolved. But these are the U.S. claims. Now, there are Cuban claims that uh, somehow uh, my friend Pedro Freire uh, forgot to talk about Title III and Title IV of Helms Burton, which will never be applied. And some others mentioned that it will never be applied. There's, there's, there's no way in hell that uh, Title III and IV of Helms Burton is going to apply. I assume everybody knows why. When Helms Burton was approved, and it was approved in a, in a moment of, of great tension between Cuba and the United States because of the shutdown of the uh, Brothers to the Rescue Planes. Hales Burton was approved Title I, Title I, uh, II, and three and four were simply put in the freezer. Why? Because the uh, European Union that has businesses in Cuba, let's, what it says, what Hales Burton says is that there is a cause of action in the United States against a company or an individual who is doing business in Cuba in a property that was expropriated or a property that uh, was taken by the Cuban government. Uh, the European Union simply told the United States, if you do this, this is economic war, so forget it, you're not going to do it. Uh, the Brazil said the same thing, Mexico said the same thing, everybody around the world said the same thing. If you do this, this is going to be an economic war with the United States. And the president of the United States, whether it's a Republican or a Democrat, they said the same thing. We're going to suspend the application of Title III and Title IV. And they have. In Title IV, in Title IV has to do with giving visas to come to the United States to companies that have businesses in Cuba and in property that was expropriated. That has been applied, I think, once or maybe twice to a small Jamaican company. But no big company in, the, uh, in, in Cuba uh, that has been there for a long time has accepted this or any of these things, and it will never happen. So we do have the issue of uh, 
the number one and number two of Helms Burton, that does create a, a big problem, but that is going to be negotiated. All of that is going to be negotiated, and I don't believe, uh, like Pedro, that this is going to be a big issue. I think that the, the objections and the pro-embargo movement in the United States right now, it's in very rapid decline, and it will continue. And I can tell you why all of this happened. Actually, I wrote a book about this, uh, what I learned about Cuba by going to Cuba. So I can, but I don't have time to do that. Uh, the fact is that the hardliners, and I was a hardliner, I was in the Bay of Pigs, and I was a general counsel of the Cuban American National Foundation for 11 years. We have missed the ball. We have made a mistake on how to interpret the relation between Cuba and the United States totally. I mean, it's not, it's not even funny anymore. Uh, we have simply applied the wrong technique to deal with Cuba. We need to engage Cuba. We need to, and part of this, of this discussion here yesterday and today has been about that. We need to be involved in Cuba, and this is now a big discussion in Miami and other places, we need to get involved. People like Carlos Rodriguez and the Cuba Study Group and so on are going to Cuba and doing things in Cuba, or trying to do, or talking. This is what we have to do. Anything else is, is nonsense. Sorry about that, Pedro. Uh, it's, it, it is nonsense. It's, 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 it's way back then. And yeah, sure, Marco Rubio may uh, stay another, well, Marco Rubio is not going to go anywhere, but he may be uh, still some sort of, uh, of uh, factor in this, uh, Ted Cruz uh, may be also a factor, Bob Menendez, I don't know. All of these people are on the way out. The American public wants to deal with Cuba, 60%, 70%. And the American companies, and I have, by the way, a consulting company, I get calls uh, every day practically, and I'm not the only one. There's a lot of people in the same, in the same situation. We need to move away from the old formulas. The old formulas do not work, will never work. And right now, they're in, in deep decline. The folks who promote the, uh, look, I was, I've been here in this city for a long, long time. I was stunned when after the Obama, uh, Raul Castro thing, there were 20 people in Versailles. What are you talking about? When the Elian Gonzalez situation, there were 15,000 people in A Street. And now there were 20 people in Versailles. They tried to do a, a, a big uh, meeting at the Jose Marti Park. There were 100 people there. If they don't see that, again, sorry, Pedro, if you don't see that, you don't see it, you don't understand anything. The vast majority of Cuban Americans right now want to deal with Cuba. Why? Because of the Cuban Adjustment Act. And we discussed this in the foundation 20 years ago. The Cuban Adjustment Act makes, allows Cubans to come to the United States. But they're not political refugees. They are people who come here to live better, to make money, and then take the money back to Cuba. And again, you don't understand that. You don't understand anything. We had this discussion in the 90s with Jorge Mas and Pepe Hernandez and all of that. This is a new situation because we allow the Cuban Adjustment Act to continue, and all these people coming over, and the wet food, dry food, all of that, we did, we did that. And we knew that if the, we didn't get some resolution of the Cuban situation early in the 90s, there was not gonna be any resolution that we liked, because the changes in the relationship between Cuba and the United States. I'm sorry if I got uh, carried away, but, but I think we need to, we don't understand, and this is a very important, ASC is a very important organization. We need to understand where we are so we go to some place that is better than what we have now. Thank you, Tony. Our last discussant is Jose Pagli. I'm going to speak from here unless I'm not heard well. Is that okay? I've been asked to comment on two very No? Very interesting. I think I'm going to start position. with Matthias' paper, <laughs> which, I hope, <laughs> which I hope. Which I hope. Here we go. I'm going 
going to start with Matias' paper, which I hope you all read when it becomes available to the ASCII's uh, website and so on, because it is one of the most balanced, non-ideological writings that I have seen on this topic of the crisis. Very well thought, it's very practical, and I think it is something that is worthy of being presented not just here, but in Cuba. And I'm going to try to tell you why. Uh, first of all, I, 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 always had a very hard time getting along with economists, but I do happen to have a lot of friends of that persuasion. So, and when I was invited many years ago to become part of ASCII, I asked her, why, I'm not an economist, uh, are there any lawyers there? And they said, yes, we have one. And that one was Matias, who is very humble and very discreet, but he's one of the founders of ASCII that is celebrating my wedding anniversary today, a silver wedding anniversary. Yeah. His paper, and I have read a number of papers from Matthias on this topic, is very good, very thorough, and he is similar of using the Ajiaco for purposes of resolving this conundrum. It's a very, very opportune symbol. Uh, there's one thing that I don't know, and that is something that we all have to realize. That Ajiaco is going to have a number of ingredients that do not come from our side, come from our perception of this problem. They will necessarily come out of the legal brief that's gonna be presented by Cuba. So when I began reading this paper, it at the very beginning says that it's gonna be very difficult to resolve this problem while we have a socialist government in Cuba. My reaction to that was, okay, we better think about it as a possibility because we may never get to resolve it all of us. I mean, we need to work with what we have at hand. We need to have that legal group. Think about it. Think about what they are going to be presenting as part of their position on this. Only yesterday, the person who heads the CEPAL, Conferencia Económica para América Latina, made a claim, I don't know how she can support that. That's one of my problems with economists. And I, as a lawyer, and most of us, all of us here as lawyers, we deal with facts. Economists tell me they deal with facts too, and they quantify them and so on. But this woman said Cuba has suffered damages on, I think it was hundreds of thousands of millions last year, 2020. We, we need to realize that that is going to be part of that, and that's going to be making it a lot more difficult as Matias points in. He also says something that I think is very valuable for us to understand. The only true bilateral issue that exists between Cuba and the United States had to do with those certified claims that he and all the people in this panel talked about. That's the only true bilateral issue. Another element in the Cuban brief that we need to have in our mind before we sit down. Interest. Wisely, Matias leaves interest out of that calculation that he made. And I say wisely because in the experience of the United States dealing with other countries in situations like this one, I don't know of any case where we have charged interest. Cuba has two issues regarding the valuation of these claims. One is the valuation itself. They will contest that. And they will definitely contest the fact that interest in the international law experience is not something that you add to claims like this. The other thing that we have trouble also understanding, and I don't say that we need to understand that, but that is their position, and we need to know it's this, is that Cuba denies that what they call nationalizations of American assets, which from their position are no longer American assets from the they were nationalized by the Cuban government. They didn't use retaliation, and they didn't use any discrimination. I'm bringing this all up basically because I've been living in this town for 36 years. And from the very first moment, I have seen, I have identified, I have un tried to understand this issue not just the claims, the relationship between Cuba and the United States from all kinds of perspectives. But I have come to the conclusion 
as Tony in some ways mentioned just now, that it is more than anything a political football. Okay? And again, I have to deal with facts. And the fact is that that political football is deflating at a very fast rate. <laughs> now, we can blame President Obama for that deflation. We can blame his uh, Nobel Prize aspiration, whatever. We can blame Tom Brady for all I know. But I do know that that political football is getting a lot more difficult to play with to the extent that I don't even think Tom Brady will be able to toss it in six, seven months. And one of the reasons, I think, why this issue of the claims, difficult as it is, impossible to resolve overnight, will be a part of the uh, conversation between Cuba and the United States in the very near future, before the end of the Obama administration, is because I see it as a key to sustain that process that Obama has opened. Again, I don't think it's going to be resolved between January 2017, but I do think that steps are going to be taken to take more air of that political football. And if you want to take all the air of that political football, that's the one thing you can do. Move ahead with this, open this to debate. And what is surprising is that uh, Matias was telling me something this morning which is absolutely true in the sense that it's something that you can easily verify. Very little talk, very little has been said or written about this topic since December 17. I happen to be in Cuba on December 17, sitting in a dais like this one, about to begin a panel like this one and speak when I got a call from one of my daughters here telling me what she was looking at at CNN. I had been invited to that conference, which is a conference again, and something that I have. I'm just a regular Joe, I'm not a politician, I'm not a diplomatic, but that was at the School for Diplomats in Cuba. And it is a conference that is held every year on the relationship between the two countries. That conference was called the U.S.-Cuba relations under or during the two last years of Obama. I was surprised that I was invited. I asked, well, what should I talk about? You can talk whatever you want. I have been invited to the same conference this year, but this time they didn't tell me you can talk about whatever you want. They asked me specifically to speak about the claims issue in that very same conference come December. Cuba has an interest in discussing this, and their position is also that nothing, nothing has prevented them other than the unwillingness of the United States in terms of discussing it. Going back to Pedro, Pedro said something that's very similar to what, uh, he's talking about the slicing of the salami. And again, this slicing of the salami is not gonna be done just by us. It's gonna be done, going to be shared with other people. But when I heard what Pedro was gonna talk about, and I look at the title of this conference, which is, What's next? I have an answer for that, and I have a question for Pedro, because I truly understood this as the hardwiring by the embargo laws and the interplay that that hardwiring has right now, after December 17, with the new offer rules, so on. I think that those rules and regulations were supposed to be changed this same week. Is that correct? I haven't heard it happen yet. But still, to me, in my mind, it's a mess. It's impossible to really advise anybody as to what can be done between the hard wiring and the clarification that we get from, from, from the executive uh, power. So, question to Pedro, because I want you to ask questions to Pedro too. Mm -hmm. What will it take for ASCII to hold a conference, an institution like ASCII, not just ASCII, the International Law Section of Florida Bar, for instance, mm -hmm. to hold a conference like this one in Havana next year? Is a license required for that? Is something that we just get, and get together and travel for that purpose? With a partnership with uh, a 
counterpart of ASCII or of the Florida Bar in, in Cuba? Before My first federal. take on that is that uh, you would be allowed to do such a conference under the Educational General License. So I, I don't think that's a problem at all. Uh, I think that's something that is absolutely foreseen and allowed mm -hmm. under this. And as a point of personal privilege, since my dear friend uh, saw fit to uh, uh, kind of impute what he thinks it is, is my position, I, I wanted to clarify something. I think that the policy initiative by the Obama administration is exactly the right thing to do. And if you were paying attention to my fairy tale, my conclusion is that it is time, it is high time for Cuban Americans to understand that the future of Cuba lies in Cuba and that the freedom of Cuba does not flow through Washington, D.C. It never has, it never will, it never should have been. And if you think it otherwise, just remember, of the, Platt, just remember the Platt Amendment and remember the effect that that had. So I hope that clarifies my position. And my phone hasn't stopped ringing off the hook since December 17th, and I am very involved in facilitating the reapprochement. I um, wanted to... I wanted to thank all the panelists and the discussants, and since we're running really out of time, to give a last couple of minutes for questions uh, from the public. And what I'll do is take a, a quick round, if you could keep your questions very short so that we don't infringe on the next session. Uh, yes, sir. Resolve it. Uh, the U.S. has had sanctions, either authorized by the U.N. or not, against many countries: China, uh, Zimbabwe, South Africa, etc. I have never th heard of a case in which the c China, which is not a minor actor in the world, was ever successful in legitimizing a claim for a U.S. embargo. Is the Cuban claim legitimate under international law? An another question right here in the center. Yes, you had a question. <clears throat> when talking about claims and restitution, it might be a good idea to remember uh, what happened and what the consequences of the claims that France imposed to the Republic of Haiti in 1825 or the Entente imposed to the Weimar Republic in 1919 and the difference that occurred after World War II when the United States and the United uh, Nations uh, helped out Germany and Japan. Questions? Right up, up front. Yes, sir. I want to make a couple of questions to uh, Professor uh, Travieso. Uh, he seems to be a pretty good cook in terms of preparing the ajiaco. My question is, from the Cuban side, Cubans in the island, how do you think they would approach to your proposal? Uh, second, we're talking about the claims, but we need to, not to overlook, that other section of the claims, of the Cuban claims, involve claims concerning aggression, claims concerning invasion, claims concerning sabotage, etc. And that's a huge package also. A uh, question over there at the end. Uh, yes, uh, Pedro, the story that comes to mind is Alice in Wonderland when she faced, uh, what is it, Cheshire, the, the Cat Cheshire, and asked, you know, which way to go. I think you all want to resolve the claims issue, but the problem is which road you take for what you leave behind, leaves banking, leaves uh, mortgages, you know, leaves the possibility for people to buy a home. 
So you have many ways to settle the, the, the claims issue, but what are you going to leave behind? One last question, the gentleman at the end. Pascal Fletcher, just to comment on what Antonio said, that he didn't think a major company was penalized under Helms-Burton. Share it. Canada, the biggest Canadian investor, their executives were penalized under Helms-Burton. It didn't stop them, um, and they're still the biggest investor in nickel. So my question is, does the panel think that the Moa nickel claim is a major obstacle to, say, investment by U.S. companies in the nickel sector, where, you know, Cuba has among the top reserves of nickel and cobalt in the world? So are, do you think U.S. companies, mining companies, will be nervous about the Moa nickel claim and the need to resolve it, despite the fact that share it's gone ahead anyway? And we'll give our panelists 30 seconds to quickly respond. Do you want to start on that? <laughs> okay. Uh, difficult. Uh, uh, I, I think the most important here is that Cuba has a contract claim, and that is going to be on the table. Is legitimate or not is questionable. What is important, if it is recognized as a legitimate, that created precedent that the United States government won't even talk about. Uh, there are some resolution from the United Nations condemning the embargo for many years. There's an order. Cuba government conceded that it's a genocide. Genocide maybe doesn't qualify, doesn't meet the requirement for that. There are some terrorist activities in Cuba, killing of Cuban citizens from the United States in the 60s. As you all know, that may be some damages. It's the same way that the default judgment has uh, been uh, guided some default judgment, Cuba is entitled to receive some compensation for those That's all, that I think are legitimate. Uh, the economic damages, maybe not, but you know, it's on the table, and once it's on the table, it has to be settled without creating a precedent. So I think that now Cuba has a contract claim. Cuba recognized the right of the U.S. citizen to be compensated. So it's important that at least is on the table for negotiation and for a final settlement. That's my answer. Okay. Yes. I'll try to be brief to answer the two questions and make another observation. First, how would Cuba react to the Ajiaco? <laughs> well, two things. First, Cuba's position on this and other things has been to delay as much as they can and try to get by as cheaply as they can, which is understandable, not necessarily approve of it, but that's, so they would like the Ajiaco to the extent that the amount of money that they had to come up with is greatly reduced. Second way, they would like the HIACO because some of the mechanisms for doing my step two is providing me mechanisms for companies with claims to invest in Cuba. So paying them out in a way is a way to bring money into Cuba. So I would think that they would be generally receptive. They will raise many hackles and objections, but on the, in principle, I think that if you slice the salami thinly that way, they will probably be willing to buy it. Second, the question that was just raised about the legitimacy of the Cuban claims against the U.S. raising from the embargo. Without getting into any detail, I was answered two ways. First, it's unprecedented and it's not recognized by international law. But secondly, even if it were, that is a bilateral government to government issue has nothing to do with the rights of private individuals or compensation for their property claims. Trying, that's why in Cuba used to say confusing the gimnasia con la manesia. They are two different <laughs> things. They, don't, they, they are not related. They are just Cuba throws them in and say, hey, by the way, you owe me money too. One more thing I need to say because I need to talk about this. Hans Burton. First, Hans Burton is a Damocles sword. The reason the many portions of Hans Burton have not gone into place is because the U.S. president, each six months, has to certify that Cuba is making progress to resolving these issues. The day a Republican president, probably, but any president, decides not to do it or forgets, all this is going to come down. In fact, I personally believe that Hans Burton needs to be repealed in its entirety, period, end of sentence. Uh, not only in the claims issue, but in many others that we have been talking about. Okay. And I think I'll stop there. Thank you, Jose. On the, <clears throat> on the question of the validity of Cuba's claim for embargo losses, also I have two answers different from <laughs> my colleague. It's valid if you find an international tribunal that recognizes that it's valid. And two, the experience with other precedents, with, with other sanctions 
uh, is not a valid precedent in the case of Cuba because the, the embargo against Cuba is, un, is unprecedented. And like most legal questions when it comes to Cuba, this is a question of first impression. So that precedent is less important. And also, public international law, it's not Anglo-American common law. Precedent is less important to begin with. It's a more political area of law. So I would imagine that, uh, that the embargo loss claim would enjoy a fair amount of support. Uh, thank you. One last word, Pedro. Yeah. Um, I think the better, the better Cuban definition is vamos a no confundir el hambre con las ganas de comer, which is a little bit different. Uh, I, I think Professor Gabilondo hit the nail on the head in trying to understand and, and the framework for claims. And, and also, and I'm glad we're having this conversation because people talk of claims as one universal global thing, and it's really very layered, very complicated. It's like a pastelito. There, there, there's a lot of layers here, and then there's some guava and some cheese somewhere in the middle. Uh, in, under Cuban law, Cuba took over on the revolutionary decrees, la ley de reforma agraria, there, there was one chunk of property taken over there. La ley de reforma urbana took other chunks of property. There were corporate uh, nationalizations that the last round took place in 1967. And then there were some laws having to do with people who left the country and left their properties behind. So even at the Cuban level, even for Cuban nationals who lost their property, this merits an entire conference with Cuban attorneys and Cuban governmental officials participating so that we understand the fundamental foundation under Cuban law for any claims that may arise thereunder. Thank you. Thank you very much to our panelists, discussants, and to all of you. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.